This lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will be about some analogues of the Heisenberg group that are called, rather unimaginatively, extra special groups. Um, I didn't invent this terminology, so don't blame me for it. Um, so in previous lectures, we've classified groups of order up to 24. So let's have a quick look at groups of order 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. And most of these, nothing new happens. 25 is of order p squared, so there are two abelian and nothing else. 26 is order two times a prime, so we get a cyclic and a dihedral group. 29 is prime, so we only get a cyclic group. 28, you have to think a little bit more about, but this is of a form four times a prime. So it turns out to be very similar to the case of groups of order 20. And in fact, we get four groups, two abelian ones, one dihedral one, and one binary dihedral one. So order 27 is the only order that might give some new phenomena. So, well, 27 is three cubed. So what we're going to look at is groups of order P cubed for P prime. Um, and first of all, there are three abelian ones, which are not terribly exciting because we have Z over P cubed Z, Z over P squared Z times Z over P Z, and Z over P Z all cubed. So um, what we're going to discuss are the non-abelian ones, and it turns out there are always two non-abelian ones. Um, if the group is non-abelian, there are two possibilities. That it can have um, elements of order p squared, or all elements have order one or p. That's because the order must divide p cubed and it can't be p, p cubed because then the group would be abelian. Now, if p equals two, we've already classified them and there are two, the dihedral group of order eight and the quaternion group of order eight. And there are no groups such that all elements of order two because we saw that if all elements of order two, the group has to be abelian. If P is odd, then there is one group with an element of order P squared and one group of elements of order P. So although for both P equals two and P odd, we get two non-abelian groups, they don't really quite correspond. The, 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 the classification is different for P2 and P odd. Um, so um, in any case, we can... Um, make some easy observations about the structure of the group. If G is a group of order P cubed and is non-abelian, the center of G is of order P and must be isomorphic to Z over PZ. That's because any P group with more than one element has a non-trivial center. And the center of a non-abelian group um, can't have index a prime, as we saw earlier, so it must have indexed p squared must be this. And let, let, let's call the center z. And then g modulo z must be isomorphic to z modulo pz squared. I'm, I'm using z in two different ways. Here it means the integers and here it means the center of g. Sorry about that, it's standard terminology in both cases. Um, and that's because G modulo its center can't be cyclic unless it's trivial. So G looks sits in an extension like this. One goes to Z modulo PZ, goes to G, goes to Z modulo PZ, all squared goes to one. So it's an extension of an elementary abelian group of order P squared by a cyclic group of order P. And we have to figure out what it is. Um, first, let's look at the case when um, all elements of order 1 or p. Um, first of all, are there any examples of such groups that aren't for p equals 2? But there are for p greater than 2 because we can take <coughs> all the following matrices 
um, that are three by three matrices. So this is in GL3 of FP. This is the finite field with three with P elements. Um, and this is obviously a group of order P cubed. And you can easily check it's non-abelian. And the question is, do all its elements of order P? And if so, why do they stop having order P when P is equal to 2? Well, if you look at this group here, sorry, this vector space. So here we've got a vector space. And we can define an exponential map from this to our group. And the exponential map is just given by x of a is equal to 1 plus a plus a squared over 2 factorial. And we notice that a cubed is equal to 0 if a is one of these matrices. So, so the exponential map just looks like that. And it's got an inverse, which is the logarithm map, where log of 1 plus a is just a minus a squared over 2, and we notice that a cubed is equal to 0. So um, the exponential and logarithm maps are just polynomials. And x of a plus b is equal to x of a times x of b if a b equals b a. In general, this doesn't hold, but it's at least true if a and b commute. So in particular, x of n a is equal to x of a to the power of n. Um, and now, if we've got an element um, g in this group here, let's work out what g to the p is. Well, this is equal to um, x of p times log of g, which is equal to 1, because p times log of g is equal to 0, because p times anything is 0, since we're working over the field with p elements. So we see that all elements of this group here have order p, except when p equals 2, because we need to divide by 2 factorials. So this only works if p is not equal to 2. And this only works if p is not equal to 2. So we've got a non-abelian group of exponent p unless p equals 2. What happens if p equals 2? The group just becomes the dihedral group of order 8 and does indeed have elements of order 4. So this argument breaks down. Um, so this, uh, you, you remember when we did groups of order um, 4 or possibly 8, I think we commented that if all elements of a group of order one or two, then the group is abelian. And we now see this fails for elements all having order one or three. So we've got a group whose elements all of order one or three, and it's not abelian. Um, um, we can easily check that there's only one such group of elements of order p because any group of order p cubed let's take it non-abelian and g to the p equals one for all p um, you can see it must actually be a semi-direct product z mod times pz times z modulo pz so that's z with z modulo pz acting on this group here. Well, this is a two-dimensional vector space over a field of p elements, and its automorphisms are just two by two matrices, and the automorphisms of order p are not too difficult to classify. They're all conjugate to this automorphism here. So up to isomorphism, this element, we may as well take a generator of this element to be acting on this group here by this automorphism. So we see that this group can be given as follows. It has elements a to the p equals 1, b to the p equals 1. So a and b are generators of this, a, b equals b, a. So they commute with each other. And then we take an element c here, 
and we know c to the p equals one and c commutes with a c b is equal to a times b c so you can now check that these generators do in fact um, define a group of order p cubed fairly easily so this shows there's at most one group of order p cubed that's non abelian has all elements of order p and as we found one for p odd um, it must be that group so there's a unique group of order p cubed for p odd with these two properties now let's move on to the groups where g is order p cubed and is non-abelian and has an element of order p squared and let's see if we can find all such groups well g has a normal subgroup um, z modulo p squared z so this is contained in g um, so g is generated by so, so z modulo p squared is generated by an element a with a to the p squared equals one and now let's pick b not in this c modulo p squared z and then what we know about b and a well b has to act non-trivially on a otherwise the group would be abelian so b a b to the minus one is equal to a to the something and the automorphisms of z to the p squared z are all of the form a to the one plus um, something times p and we can simply replace b by a power of p and we may as well assume that it takes a to a to the one plus p if it takes a to the one plus 2p or 3p we simply change b to something else so that it's like that and then what is b to the power of p well b to the power of p must be an element of order one or p here otherwise b would have order p squared so it must be one a to the p a to the p squared and so on and you can see that the group is determined by these relations so the only ambiguity is what is b to the power of p well if b to the power of p is one then g is just a semi-direct product z modulo p squared z times z semi-direct product sorry z quotiented out by p z and if p equals two then this case here really does give us a different group so p equals two this gives us the quaternion group um, this is the dihedral group if p equals two so we really get two do we really do get two different cases of p equals two um, it looks at first sight as if we're also getting several different cases if p is odd but it turns out that if p is odd then the group with b to the p equals a squared turns out to be the same as this group here the, the, the point is we can change um b to let's call it c equals b times a and this element has similar properties you can see that c a c to the minus one is still a to the one plus p so the question is what is c to the power of p so let's calculate it um, well, um, we know that b a b to the minus 1 is equal to a to the 1 plus p. So um, c to the p is b a to the p. That's b a to the p, which is b a b a b a and so on. Now a to the p commutes with everything. So what we can do is is we can swap around this b and the a using the fact that b to the a equals a b times a to the p. So every time we swap around an a and a b, we pick up an extra factor of a to the power of p. So this is equal to a to the p times a b a b a b a and so on and then we get a to the p squared a b 
a b b a and then we get a uh sorry uh it's not a to the p squared it's a to the 2p then we get a to the 3p times a a b b b a and so on so we keep moving b's to the right and every time we swap round a b and an a we pick up a factor of a to the power of p so we continue like this and we get a to the p times p plus one over two times p times a to the p b to the p um, that's because we have to exchange a's and b's p times p plus one over two times in order to get all the b's to the right um, now, if p is not equal to 2, this is of the form a to the p squared to the p plus 1 over 2, which is 1. So this is just equal to a to the p, b to the p. Um, so, um, um, so, uh, we had these relations b to the p is um, a to the p, but um, c to the p is um, going to be b to the p multiplied by a to the p. Um, so this, this changes the pth power of our element by a factor of a to the p. So instead of, um, so if, if b to the p is some power of a, so if it's a to the n p, say, then by changing b to b times a, we can get an element c to the p, which is a to the n plus 1 times p. And by doing this repeatedly, we can just get an element, um, a, a new generator, say, d, such that d to the p is equal to 1. So our group has um, relations a to the p squared equals 1, d a d to the minus 1 equals a to the 1 plus p, d to the p equals 1. So our group is a semi-direct product. So we really only get two groups of order um, non-abelian groups of order p cubed. And we can sort of picture them as follows. So we have two obvious ways of constructing a group of order p cubed. We can take these matrices. And the second way is to take a semi-direct product, p squared z, semi-direct product z over p z. And we can look at these for p equals 2, 3, 5, 7, 11 and so on and for this sort of group we get um one example we can sort of think of these as being a family and we also get a group like that for p equals two and we get a group like this for p odd however for p even these two groups are actually isomorphic and we get a new group which is the quaternion group q8 so so this one this group here is uh d8 so th this is this is a sort of picture of the classification of groups of order p cube we get two for each prime but and we really get two families which are the different from most odd primes and happen to be the same for p equals two and we get a third family which only works for p equals two um well, these groups are the analogues of the Heisenberg group. In quantum mechanics. So let's recall what the Heisenberg group is. Suppose you look at all functions. So F is a function from the reals to the complex numbers. And then you can transform these functions in two ways. You can take F of X to f of x plus a. So we just translate the function left or right. And we can also change the function f of x to e to the 2 pi i b x times f of x. So we just multiply it by this um, periodic function. And in quantum mechanics, 
One of these, I think this one corresponds to a momentum operator and this one corresponds to a position operator, or maybe they're the, they're the other way around. I can't quite remember. So if we call this transformation TA, we call this transformation TB, we see that TA and TB don't quite commute. We can, we can do them in one order or we can do them in the other order. And these differ by a factor of e to the 2 pi i AB, which is just multiplication by a complex number of absolute value 1. Um, so that should be TB times TA. So we get a three-dimensional group um, of um, all operations where we take f of x to um, e to the 2 pi i c plus bx times f of x plus a. And this gives us a three-dimensional group of transformations. And you can see that it's got um, a subgroup isomorphic to the circle group, just a multiplication by numbers e to the 2 pi i bx. And then it sits like that. And the quotient is just a product of two copies of the reals, because these two translations commute up to multiplication like that. So that's the Heisenberg group in quantum mechanics. It's an extension of R times R by S1. Now let's do this over a finite field. So F is now a function from a finite field to the complex numbers. And we've got these translations TA, which take F of X to X plus A, where A is now in the finite field of order P. And we've got TB takes F of X to e to the 2 pi i b x over p um, times f of x. And this is um, b times x is only a number modulo p, um, but e to the 2 pi i has period 1. So this number is actually a well-defined p root of unity. That's why we put the 2 pi i in up there. And these commute with each other up to multiplication by something of the form e to the 2 pi i c over p for c um, uh, in the finite field. And this, this is well defined because e to the 2 pi i x is periodic. So we, we get a group of order p cubed, which um, sits um, like this. So we just replace R by FP and we replace S1 by FP. And this is now just one of the groups of order P cubed. In fact, it's usually the one, um, it, it, it's isomorphic to the one of upper triangular matrices. Um, so uh, the, the point is that groups of order P cubed are very similar to the Heisenberg group. Um, for instance, if you look at their representation theory, the representation theory is very similar. Um, well, Heisenberg groups um, exist not only in one dimensional. I mean, you can also do Heisenberg groups in n dimensions, and these are rather similar, except it's an extension. Oops, I missed out the G. 1 goes to S, 1 goes to G, goes to R to the n times r to the n. So you can do the same thing, except you replace one dimensional space by n dimensional space, and you get a group like that. And you can do the same thing over finite fields. You get a group fp goes to g goes to fp to the n times fp to the n goes to 1. And uh, groups similar to this are called extra special groups. So what's an extra special group G? Well, G has order P to the 1 plus 2N. The center is order P. Um, let's call the center Z. And G modulo Z is isomorphic to Z over PZ to the 2N. So these are the analogs of the Heisenberg groups. They should have been called Heisenberg groups, not extra special groups. But we're stuck with this rather rather silly name. Um, so what can you do with extra special groups? Well, 
they, they, they turn out to be quite easy to classify, which is quite convenient because they, they, they turn up quite often in group theory. Um, so I'll just sort of sketch how you classify them. It turns out you can build them all out of groups of order P. First of all, if we take G over Z, which is Z modulo PZ to the 2N, this actually has a skew symmetric form which takes a, b to a, b, a to the minus 1, b to the minus 1. And this is now in the center, which you can think of f, p. And you can check that a, b is equal to b, a inverse, or minus b, a, if you think of this as being in the finite field like that. So what we've got is really a vector space of dimension 2n over field with the skew symmetric form. And you know how to classify skew symmetric forms. Skew symmetric forms are just a sum um, of forms with the matrix 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So any skew symmetric form on a, on a field, if it's non-degenerate, can be split up into a sum of two-dimensional forms. And similarly, G sort of splits up as a central product of groups of order P cubed, which we've classified, there are just two of them. So a central product of two groups A and B means you take the product A and B and you identify the centers of A and B. So we, we, we um, um, quotient out by things of the form Z1 minus, so Z1 prime to the inverse where we're given an isomorphism between the center of A and the center of B. Well, groups of all P cubed all have center equal to Z, so you can identify the centers. And so by taking the product and taking a suitable quotient of the center, you can construct all extra special groups from the groups of order P cubed. It turns out we get two extra special groups of order p to the 1 plus 2n. And these can be distinguished as follows. For p odd, 1 has all elements of order p, and 1 has an element of order p squared. So for p even, we again get two groups, but you can't distinguish them like this because one always has order p squared. And you can distinguish them using the ARF invariant. So I'll finish this lecture by just telling you what the ARF invariant is. So if you've got one of these extra special groups of order 2 to the 1 plus 2n, so G over Z is um, a group Z modulo 2Z to the 2N. And this has a quadratic form Q on it. So we've got a map Z modulo 2Z to the 2N goes to Z modulo 2Z, where this is the center. And this quadratic form is defined very easily. Q of A is just equal to A squared. You know that the square of an element in, in, in G will be an element in the center. And we can check that Q of A plus B is, Q, sorry, Q of A, B is Q of A, Q of B um, um, times A, B where this is the skew symmetric product a, b, a to the minus one, b to the minus one. So we've really got a quadratic form on a vector space over a field with two elements. And quadratic forms on f2 to the n to f can be distinguished by the ARF invariant. The ARF invariant is naught or one, and it's given by the most common value of q. It's sometimes called the democratic invariant because you just take a vote of all the values it takes and that's the ARF invariant. 
So for instance, in Q8, the quaternion group, if you look at G modulo Z, that's a group of order four, and the values of the squares of these elements are 0, 1, 1, 1. You remember that I squared, J squared, and K squared are all non-zero. So the half invariant is one because one occurs most often. If you look at the dihedral group and work out the squares of its elements, um, sorry, the squares of the elements of D8 modulo the center, three of them have order two, so their square is the identity element and one has order one. So the half invariant is zero. So the half invariant of the quaternion group is one and the half invariant of the dihedral group is zero. And similarly for all other extra special groups, of order two to the n, the half invariant will distinguish them. Okay, that's enough about extra special groups. Next lecture will be about a group theoretic map called the transfer, which we will use to classify the groups of order 30.